and then give it to the yeah. okay go ahead okay uh, <clears throat> my name is Eric John Phelps this is the fourth day of September 2017 and I was asked to review a little bit of what I know about the Jesuit power in Russia especially since the Bolshevik Revolution. I cover this in my book, Vatican Assassins, but I'm doing this for an Orthodox friend who in turn is going to tell certain Orthodox leaders what I have um, said today. So <clears throat> before I begin, to tell the story of a certain Jesuit that I knew. I want to prefix or have a nice little prelude to what I'm saying so that it becomes believable. Nobody that I know of has ever done an extensive proof has ever provided an extensive proof that the Jesuits were in complete control of the Bolshevik Revolution and its outcome. So I think I'll review that for a little bit of time. Money. And um, so we'll just go back. And uh, I want you to be reminded that the Jesuits considered the Orthodox Church heretic and to be returned to the fold of the Pope of Rome pursuant to the doctrine of the temple power that every human creature is to be subject to the Pope of Rome both spiritually and politically which is the two keys that are on the Vatican flag. So Russia was the thorn in the side of the Jesuits, even from the days of Peter the Great, because Peter the Great expelled the Jesuits from all of Russia in 1723. And it wasn't long after that he was poisoned with his favorite dish which was porridge so Peter the Great was poisoned by Jesuits the Jesuits were not excel, expel, were, were, then came back into Russia and um, the punishment for Russia was the Jesuits using Napoleon Bonaparte to attack Russia because Napoleon was advised by Jesuit Abisayas, and I cover this in my book. And Abisayas was the one who coordinated um, what Napoleon would do, and also was in cahoots with Russian Jesuits that were facilitating an easier invasion of Napoleon into Russia. And uh, this was for a twofold purpose. Napoleon was to, to punish the Orthodox. He was to punish the Russian leaders. He, he uh, didn't like Alexander I, of course. And when they met at Tilsit, they had a conference there. I believe it was on a barge. But um, the Jesuits used Napoleon to invade Russia. And... Uh, they also were involved in setting Moscow on fire because they, Napoleon invades in the winter and he's not going to be allowed to winter in Moscow. And this is why Napoleon will use that fire in Russia, in Moscow, to deliberately leave Russia and to, to move west. And at that time, he's going to sacrifice much of his army in the snows of Russia and also to the swords of the Cossacks. Cossacks. He leaves Russia on a sleigh driven by four horses 
and abandons his armies in Russia. Just as the Jesuit was told to do, this is 1812, thereabouts. Goes back to Germany and to Dresden, shows up there. Not long after, he is going to be um, arrested and confined to Elba. And the Holy Alliance is going to take place, the Congress of Vienna in 1814. In 1815, and there at the Congress of Vienna, the monarchs, Alexander I and others, are going to squabble. And so the Jesuits release Napoleon from Elba, and for the hundred days, Napoleon gathers his old forces and troops with the outward policy of finally resisting the altar and the throne in France, only for him to take up the wrong uh, mount there at Waterloo, according to Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson, when Jackson reviewed the battlefield in the 1850s, before the war between the states would begin. And Jackson said Napoleon took up the wrong field position. And that's exactly what Napoleon did. He took up the wrong field position, and because of the juncture with the Prussians and the British under Wellington, Napoleon sacrifices his army at Waterloo. All at the behest of Abisaias. His right hand man, Abisaias, was the second consul of the three man consulate, which was Napoleon, Abisaias, and Robert Dulos. So Napoleon is flees Waterloo and he is captured by the British and he is sent to St. Helena where he is gives his memoirs and he writes the memoirs of Napoleon and uh, his, um, his General Montalon is his writer and Napoleon writes about the power of the Jesuit order <clears throat> And that the Jesuits are an army and the general wants worldwide power. And you can find this quote in his memoirs by Father Chenicki in his 50 years in the Church of Rome. So the Jesuits controlled Napoleon and his invasion of Russia. And the Russian people were warned of their invasion, of their future dealings with the Jesuits by the great Fyodor Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky was one of Russia's greatest literary men in the 1880s. He wrote a book titled The Brothers Karamazov, and there's a portion of the book, or a book within the book, titled The Grand Inquisitor. And the Grand Inquisitor, Dostoevsky, says that the Jesuits want worldwide earthly dominion. They don't even believe in God, perhaps. So Dostoevsky will warn the Russian Orthodox people of the plan of the Jesuits to take Russia. Back to Napoleon. Napoleon is confined at Elba, or confined at St. Helena. He is later poisoned. There he doesn't escape and go to New Orleans, which is nonsense. Uh, Joe Wider wrote in his very good book, The Death of Napoleon, how uh, he was poisoned at um, in St. Helena. And about this time, about 1820, the Tsar Alexander I, who was a Christian, he was a Bible-believing, born-again Christian man, he um, had allowed freedom of worship in Russia. And at the time, the Orthodox leaders didn't like that because they considered that a threat to their monopoly of religious power as they were protected by the Romanov dynasty. See, Orthodox Church then had the unification of church and state, as do the Protestants, unlike the Baptists. So, uh, Tsar Alexander discovered that the Jesuits were plotting the overthrow of his, of his uh, 
kingship, of him being czar, that they wanted temporal power in Russia. So in 1820, the great Tsar Alexander I expelled the Jesuits from all the Russians. And uh, so the Jesuits were expelled, and they took up residence in Georgia, just outside of Russia. And they start and took over an Orthodox seminary there called Tiflis Seminary. Because the Jesuits had been penetrating the Orthodox Church. Hadn't quite controlled it yet, but there were, were Jesuit priests in Orthodoxy, especially at that seminary. And there would be a specific priest there who would train Joseph Stalin years later. We'll talk about that in a minute. So <clears throat> the Jesuits were expelled from all of Russia by Tsar Alexander I, and the Tsar got wind that the Jesuits were controlling the Masonic Lodge. So he shut down every Masonic Lodge in Russia in 1822. So in my book, Tsar Alexander I was a national hero, a Bible-believing Christian man who sought to protect his Russian people from being taken over by the Jesuit order who had vowed to do this pursuant to the Council of Trent and their moral theologies, which I call the Jesuit immoral theology. And uh, <clears throat> so for that, Alexander I dies suddenly of what historians will call apoplexy. Well, apoplexy is translated by myself, means poisoning. They poisoned Peter the Great in 1723. They poisoned Alexander I in 1825. But they were still expelled from Russia at this time. So another czar comes to power. He's known as Nicholas I. Nicholas I is a traitor. Nicholas I will enter into a conquer debt with the Pope on behalf of the Russian government. And this is covered in a book titled Descent into Darkness by James J. Zatko. James Zatko. He was a priest that taught at Notre Dame University in the 1960s. And his book is a essential for your library. So <clears throat> concerning the Jesuits and Russia. It's all about the Jesuits being involved with the Bolshevik Revolution and their hand in it, although he, he's not as detailed as he needs to be. So, <clears throat> um, Nicholas I enters into a concordat with the Pope, but Alexander II comes to power, and he does away with that concordat. So now Alexander II becomes an enemy of the Jesuits. So the Jesuits will raise up a group called the Anarchists in Russia and throughout Europe and even in America. It's an international anarchist conspiracy to remove certain heads of state that are not in sympathy with the Jesuit order. These anarchists will kill Alexander II. They will kill the king of Italy, Umberto I, because he's an enemy of the Jesuits. They will kill Victor Emmanuel II, who is an enemy of the Jesuits and the father of Umberto I. They will kill James Garfield in 1881 because James Garfield refuses to be subject to the temporal power of the Pope. They will kill McKinley in 1901 because McKinley will become a disobedient Protestant low-level Freemason and they'll put Theodore Roosevelt in his place after they kill him. 
uh, the anarchists will kill Sissy. Sissy was the wife of the the, uh, the uh, Emperor Ferdinand, who is the emperor of the uh, Habsburg Empire. Franz Joseph kills Sissy. The assassin will stab her through the heart with a three-sided file, nick her heart, and she'll go be brought back to die in her in her mansion while she's walking with a Rothschild lady in Geneva. This assassin walks right up to her and stabs her through the heart. Anarchists. These anarchist savages will kill 50 heads of state in the last century, last portion of the 19th century. All of these anarchists run by the Jesuits and when the Bolsheviks and the communists take over in Russia, the anarchists are either killed or merged into the Bolshevik Communist Party. So, <clears throat> the Jesuits are infuriated with the Orthodox Church leadership in 1870 because they will not attend Vatican I. That's the First Vatican Council. And in the First Vatican Council, the Jesuits in control of that council with all sorts of intrigue will have the Pope decreed to be infallible when he speaks ex cathedra. When the Jesuits accomplish this, they will be able to control the entire Roman papacy through a single man, the Pope. Today we have a first Jesuit Pope, Francis I, which even shows more of their power. Remember, every Pope has to have a Jesuit confessor so that the Jesuit general knows the very thoughts and mind of every Pope. So, <clears throat> the Jesuits are furious with the Orthodox. They refuse to attend Vatican I, and Alexander II does away with the concordat that the Rome had with, with the Tsar Nicholas I. So Alexander II is murdered. He is blown up in a carriage, they blow off his legs. After the fifth attempt, they finally kill him. I believe it's the fifth attempt. Sol Sinistian writes about this in his Gulag Archipelago, in the murder of the Tsar. The Tsar Alexander II was a great Tsar. He was the one who, um, freed all the serfs in Russia. He was getting ready to sign a Russian constitution. He did away with the secret police, the Okrana. I mean, Tsar Alexander I was a friend of the common man. So there was no need of the communists or the anarchists to kill him. He was not the typical Russian tyrant. The Jesuits wanted him to be tyrant. And so they killed him and they brought his son to power who was Alexander III. Alexander III became a complete and total Jesuit tyrant. Alexander III launched a huge pogrom against the Jews. He blamed the Jews for the murder of his father because one Jew was involved. And so we have this huge pogrom against the Jews overseen by the Jesuits through Alexander III. This evil, horrible, terrible, Jesuit-controlled czar. So by this time, the Jesuits have, have killed three good czars. They killed Peter the Great in 1723. They killed Alexander I in 1825. And now they killed Alexander II in 1881. And celebrating their murder by having a great big Jewish pogrom. I think they killed 300,000 Jews in Russia. Wonderful Jesuit time. So, if you th wonder if the Jesuits hate the Jews, you just need to read E. Boyd Barrett's work, Rome Stoops to Conquer. Rome Stoops to Conquer. And that ex Jesuit, E. Boyd Barrett, tells us of the hatred the Jesuit order at the top has for the Jews. And this is why no Jew was allowed in the Jesuit order from 1593 to 1946. 
So back to Russia. The Jesuits then began plotting the final solution to the Jewish question. And they start this in about the 1880s in Germany, France. The Jesuits will write the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And as I quote that in my book, that fact, it comes from um, a certain gentleman who wrote a book titled Beyond the Di uh, Behind the Dictators. Behind the Dictators, he wrote that work in 1942, and he shows that the protocols of the elders of Zion is, are nothing more than the secrets of the elders of the Borg Fontaine. The Jews never wrote the protocols of the elders of Zion. Leo Lehman was the author of Behind the Dictators, a Roman Catholic priest who was saved, he came to know the Lord, believed the gospel of Christ, died for his sins, was buried and rose again, truly repented, was a believer, and hence he writes this book. Leo Lehman. So the Jesuits write the protocols of the learned elders of Zion in about the 1880s in France on the border of Germany. The Jesuits will then begin to circulate the protocols in Russia. And the protocols are all true except for one fact. It's not the Jews that are behind the protocols. It's not the Jews doing all these things. It's the Jesuits. And even in the protocols, they say our only enemy of us Jews are the Jesuits. It says they're in the protocols. So the Jesuits wrote the protocols, and everything they wrote in there, they brought to pass. The French Revolution, they talk about, was their work. They, how they, kill, they control Freemasonry, how they kill certain Freemasons that are not obedient to them. How they, how they poison the, the Gentile nations with vaccinations and inoculations. All of this they brought it to pass. The Jesuits have done all of these things. The control of banking. Uh, everything that you read in the protocols of the learned elders of Zion are true. Except it's not the Jews who are responsible. There are certain Jews working on this, but they're subject to the Jesuits. As my friend, my late friend Sherman Skolnick said, these are hot Jews. These are papal court Jews. They're Masons, like the like the ADL and B'nai B'rith and others. It's Masonic, the Jews who are Freemasons, subject secretly to the Pope. So they're circulating the protocols of the Elders of Zion in Russia to incite anti-Jewish fury in Russia. Because the Orthodox Church for years was against the Jews. The Orthodox Church was behind, what helped and aid and embedded the, the pogroms of Alexander III. There was no outcry amongst the patriarch and others. And then in 1905, we have the greatest Jewish pogrom in the history of Russia. When Tsar Nicholas II a Knight of Malta, of the Russian branch of the Knight of Malta, just like Len Horowitz is a member of the Russian branch of the Knights of Malta, for which he sued me for a couple of things in his lawsuit. Thank God the judge uh, killed. The Russian branch of the Knights of Malta is just as wicked as any other branch because they all trace their origin back to Blessed Gerard, the founder of the Knights of Malta in like 1048, the Knights Hospitallers, the Crusaders who would take Jerusalem from the Muslims, from the Saracens in 1099 and hold it for approximately 80 years or so. You can see a movie about this called The Kingdom of Heaven when Salah Hadin finally takes Jerusalem from the Knights of Malta, the Knights of the Equestrian Order, the Templars, in 1191, I believe. It's called the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And today Israel, in the eyes of the Pope, is the revived Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. 
And so <clears throat> you have the greatest pogrom in Russian history in 1905, spearheaded by Knight of Malta, Nicholas II, aided and abetted and encouraged by his cousin, King George V, of King George, yes, the fifth of Great Britain. And I have a picture of them. It's a very famous picture of the two cousins standing together. They look like identical twins. So King George V, it's an English, remember the English lange, the English tongue, of the Knights of Malta, Nicholas II, a member of the Russian tongue. I have a book on the Knights of Malta, uh, dedicated, written in the early 1900s, dedicated to Alex, Nicholas II, who was the czar and protector of the Russian tongue of the Knights of Malta. This is important. This is very important because there is no successful Bolshevik revolution without the Knights of Malta in Russia working with the Knights of Malta in Great Britain at the time. And hence we're going to see the birth of the Anglo-American international white power structure that will facilitate the Bolshevik revolution in 1917 in October. So, this is all the history leading up now to the Bolshevik Revolution. And in this Bolshevik Revolution, the, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion will, be, will have spread through Russia through a certain Orthodox priest there. And that Orthodox priest is a Jesuit. And uh, so they spread it all throughout Russia, creating this anti-Jewish fury. But the Jesuits are going to be very clever here. They're going to make the Bolshevik Revolution look Jewish. And so there will be leading Jews, Trotsky and others, Litvinov and certain others, who will openly be leading the Bolshevik Revolution. But there in Lenin, he's a quarter or a half racial Jew. Whenever I speak of Jews, I speak of the race. I don't speak of the religion. The religion is irrelevant. The race is everything. Because the racial Hebrew Jewish Israelites are the ones promised all the good things to come of the Abrahamic covenant of which the Lord Jesus Christ confirmed, Romans 15, 8. Christ came to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, namely, specifically, the Abrahamic covenant. So it's a promise, it's a covenant, it's a racial covenant to the racial group of people known as the Hebrews and also Israelites and also Jews, although remember, not all Jews are Hebrews, but all Hebrews are Jews, according to the New Testament. Now, so the Bolshevik Revolution, they have certain leading th things up to this. They have the, the Black Hundred in the early 1900s. They have an attempted revolution, but it doesn't succeed. We have the Jesuits sending Rasputin, from Siberia, and he being introduced to the court of Tsar Nicholas II, the Knight of Malta, and it's Rasputin that will be the advisor of Nicholas II, and he will also be the seducer of the Russian royal family. Rasputin was a Jesuit, Orthodox priest, subject to his bishop, that I name in my book. Famous picture of Rasputin with his bishop. And uh, so the Patriots rise up and they kill Rasputin. By the way, killing Rasputin was very difficult. They had a hard time killing that demon-possessed wicked sinner. And uh, they killed Rasputin, and then they, the, the Tsar was accused of allowing Rasputin to seduce his court. The Bolshevik Revolution takes place. And guess who facilitates a successful Bolshevik revolution? The British and the Americans. Which tells you 
that the Jesuits ran the British Empire, they ran the Parliament, they ran the Queen, they ran the King at the time, who is now uh, George V through the Knights of Malta. George V had a Jesuit advisor that I cover in my book. Um, the other one that was involved in the Bolshevik Revolution at the time was, in 1917, was the ungodly and wicked apostate Presbyterian, Woodrow Wilson. He was president at the time. And Woodrow Wilson facilitates 300 Jewish leaders leaving New York City by with Leon Trotsky to have a secret, secretly, have a secret train going to Russia so that the Jews can be openly behind the Bolshevik Revolution and the Jews can be blamed for it. And without Woodrow Wilson notifying Canada to let that ship of traitors across the Atlantic, they would have never made it. So Woodrow Wilson facilitated the Bolshevik Revolution and the right-hand man, the overseer of Woodrow Wilson, was not Edward Mandel House. Edward Mandel House was the tool for Woodrow Wilson in foreign matters. That Texan, that 33rd degree Freemason, that traitor, Edward Mandel House. You can read a two-volume set called The Intimate Papers of Colonel House. The real advisor to Woodrow Wilson was a fourth degree Knight of Columbus. His name was Joseph P. Tumulty. Joseph P. Tumulty was the advisor of Woodrow Wilson for two years when Woodrow Wilson was governor of New Jersey. And he was the advisor of Woodrow Wilson while two terms in office of the President of the United States until Wilson was poisoned and his wife Edith took, Ellen took over and was the acting president until Woodrow, until Wilson dies or actually until Harding is made uh, president. And Harding was a 33rd degree Freemason. Warren Harding did many good things, but he was a 33rd degree Freemason, and he continued the work of Woodrow Wilson in financing and abetting the Bolshevik Revolution. The leaders of the whites, the Orthodox whites, was betrayed by America and Great Britain. According to Stan Monteith in his very good book, Brotherhood of Darkness, he proves that Warren Harding... Warren Gamaliel Harding gave $60 million in aid and supplies to the Reds, to the Bolsheviks, facilitating their success because without American help and supplies, the Russian people would have rose up and killed those bastard Bolsheviks. And I use the term bastard scripturally, pursuant to Hebrews 12, God is not their father. The devil is their father. So... <clears throat> With this Russian Revolution, and any, Ru any Russian historian will teach you that the Re Bolshevik Revolution was really the second French Revolution. The father of the French Revolution of 1789 is the same father of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and that's the Black Pope. The French Revolution was a communist revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution was a communist revolution. The Jesuits benefited in both revolutions. So, but at the same time, the open false policy is, this wasn't done by Jesuits, this was done by communists. As I cover in my book and in my PowerPoint, the Jesuits trained Rousseau, one of the fathers of the French Revolution. They trained uh, Robespierre, the mass murderer, in the directory, killed what, beheaded 40,000 people, something like that. And they also trained Napoleon at Corsica. So the Jesuits ran the entire French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. They ran the entire Bolshevik Revolution and the Bolshevik Wars from 1917 to 1922. And there will be American troops dispatched to Moscow to further facilitate a successful Bolshevik revolution. And William Grady covers this in his new work on the nation of Israel.
It even has pictures of American troops in, Mos in uh, Moscow, I believe. The Bolshevik Revolution must succeed. It cannot fail because the fall of Moscow is regarded as the second greatest event by Jesuit Edmund Walsh in his book, uh, uh, The Decline and Fall of the Russian Empire. He wrote in 1925, Walsh says that the fall of the Russian Empire is the greatest single event after the fall of the Roman Empire. Why? Because the Jesuits took Orthodox Russia, which includes the huge landmass of all of Russia, in 1917 and throughout the Civil War, ending in what, 1922 or thereabouts. At this time, the Jesuits running the Bolsheviks will take all of the Tsar's fortunes, the rubies, the emeralds, the gold. It's a huge fortune. And they will imprison the Russian Orthodox Patriarch. They will kill 5,000 priests and nuns of the Orthodox Church. And this is their vengeance because the priests and nuns that they killed were against Vatican I and were outrightly and outspokenly against the infallibility of the Pope in Vatican I. So they all have to die, and they will die. And while the Jesuits are at it, they're going to have fun with the Mennonites. So they're going to use their Bolsheviks to kill as many Mennonites and take turns gang raping the women during the Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolsheviks are going to serve as the crusaders for the Jesuits during the Bolshevik Revolution and succeeding Civil War, when the Orthodox people and the Orthodox leaders are betrayed and have to flee Russia. The Joseph Stalin, who is the real Jesuit coadjutor at this time, he is going to lead the Bolshevik army in fighting General Stanislaw Sikorsky, who is the great Polish general at the time. And General Sikorsky defeats Stalin and saves Poland from a Bolshevik oppression. But there will come a certain Polish Roman Catholic out of Poland who will have known the Jesuits well, who admired the Jesuits, and he will be the first head of Lenin's Cheka. He'll be a vicious, bloodthirsty, murderous Jesuit inquisitor. And his name out of Poland is Felix Drzezinski. Felix Drzezinski will kill. He'll be rounding up all those marked for death, bringing them in on in the trucks and, and shooting them in the back of the head in Lubyanka. Lubyanka will be the headquarters for the Holy Office of the Inquisition of the Jesuits. And they will shoot these people in the back of the head, take them out in mass burial grounds. Felix Zerzinski was the great grand inquisitor of the Jesuits that Dostoevsky warned about. Felix Zerzinski, oh, and by now, by now, 1922, when the, when the, Inquisition's going crazy. You have American Jesuit Edmund Walsh, who's there in Russia for two years, from 1922 to 1924, and he will oversee the establishment of the Bolshevik government while this Inquisition is raging. Jesuit Edmund Walsh was at the Treaty of Versailles, blaming Germany for World War I and therefore securing war in another 20 years. And that's exactly what happened. 1939, the Nazis invade Poland. 20 years, 1918, 1919, to 1920. 
So <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson is a part of that conspiracy because he's at he's at Versailles also with Lloyd George and and I think Point Karen is there for the French. So what we have here now is the great subjugation of the Orthodox leaders and the Orthodox people aided and abetted by American Freemasonry in the person of Warren G. Harding and also aided and abetted by the Knights of Columbus in the person of Joseph P. Tumulty having overseen Woodrow Wilson and Joseph P. Tumulty was overseen by the head Knights of Columbus at the time whose name was Flanagan and Flanagan was overseen by the first American Pope, James Cardinal Gibbons. James Cardinal Gibbons is responsible for the death of four American presidents, beginning with Garfield, and then McKinley, and then Wilson, and then Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding will be poisoned in San Francisco, the Jesuit city of San Francisco. <clears throat> So, the Jesuits are running Bolshevik Russia. And it's at this time that the Jesuits set up their gulag system in Siberia because the Jesuits have been in control of Siberia for at least 60 years. The Jesuits will fake a meteor hitting the earth in Siberia at Tunguska. And the fact of the matter is, it's the first thermonuclear detonation at, on the, in the world, carried out at Tunguska in 1908, thereabouts. So the Jesuits have perfected nuclear devices, nuclear detonations, well before 1945. So... <clears throat> What happens is now the the uh, Bolsheviks, led by Trotsky the Jew, Stalin the white Gentile, Georgian. Stalin, remember, was not a Russian. He was a Georgian. Just like Hitler was not a German. He was an Austrian. This is the danger that we face when we allow foreigners to run our countries. This is why the American Constitution said the man that's to be president has to be a, an American. He has to be a, an American that will be natural born. He has to be a natural born citizen. This is what Obama was not. So the Bolshevik Revolution takes place and for 10 years, from about 1922 to 32, 33, the Jews, it appears, are running Russia. Why, it's the Jews! In 1919, certain Masonic Jews take over Bavaria. And they're going to run Roman Catholic German Bavaria for about 18 months. All facilitated, by the way, by Jesuits, of course to make the communist movement look Jewish when the communist movement is strictly Jesuit because they perfected the doctrines of communism on their reductions in Paraguay from 1609 to 1759. But we have to make communism look Jewish. So we have to have the father of modern day communism appear to be a Jew, who's Karl Marx. And a High-level Freemason. What we, and we are not told is what was told to the German people by Otto von Bismarck, the Bible-believing, born-again Lutheran Christian man who said Karl Marx was tutored by the Jesuit Peter Becks in the British Museum for many years. And Peter Becks goes on to be the head of the Jesuit order in the late 1800s. So the Bolshevik level revolution, why it's Jewish. The Jews have taken over Russia. And these Jews are killing the Orthodox. You see why the Orthodox people hate the Jews? They believe the lie that the Jews killed their leaders and imprisoned the patriarch. 
all for the purpose as we shall see. So Stalin, then, who's the secret uh, power behind the Jesuits and the Bolshevik Revolution, Joseph Stalin will be trained back in the 1800s, from 1896 to thereabouts, for four or five years, by Capuchins in Gori, and they see the leadership of Joseph Duchavelli, or however you say his last name, and they give him an all-paid education, a scholarship, to Tiflis Seminary, where Stalin will be trained by certain Jesuits disguising as Orthodox, and one of them is Father Dimitri. Father Dimitri is a tutor of Stalin, and then all of a sudden, at the end of five years, Stalin begins to advocate communist doctrines, and Father, I believe it's Dimitri, expels Stalin from becoming a communist. But when Stalin comes to power, and he's busy purging in the 30s and the 40s, in the 30s, he never purges Father Demetrius. That's his name, Demetrius. He never purges Father Demetrius. I wonder why. Because Father Demetrius was the Jesuit who brought him to power. Demetrius dies in 1941. Peaceful death. So Stalin, in the beginning of the early 30s, begins his purges. It's called the Great Terror. There's a book on it called The Great Terror. And he purges all the enemies of the Jesuits. And his right-hand man is a man named Alexander Puskrevichev. And you can read about this in a book titled Svetlana, written in the 1960s when the daughter, she's the daughter of Joseph Stalin, she wrote the book, when she was brought here through the Jesuits and their CFR into the United States, I believe in the 1960s. So, Joseph Stalin will carry out the purges as directed by Alexander Puskrevichev. And there is a French church in Moscow that is the real meeting place for the Jesuits there in overseeing Stalin. And you can read about this in a book titled In Lubyanka's Shadow by Leupold L.S. Braun, and The Memoirs of an American Priest in Stalin's Moscow from 1934 to 1945. And I quote it in my book showing that in this particular church, we have American congressmen and statesmen going to visit, and one of them is Dewey, who runs for president. The filthy swine. So, in Lubyanka's Shadow, you want to get this book? By Braun. Stalin is trained by Jesuits when he's in school. And you can read about this in a book titled Three Who Made a Revolution by Bertram Wolfe. W-O-L-F-E. And in this book, Stalin talks about the Jesuits. And in this, he talks about them uh, on page 410, or thereabouts. And he says that they're always in 411. He says, then being nearly 15, he entered... Then being nearly 15, page 411, he entered the Tiflis Theological Seminary on a free scholarship, providing uniform clothing, meals, and lodging. The studies were dull, dogmatic, repetitive. The discipline was that of a, spirit, of a spiritual barracks. Loyalty to God and the Tsar, the order is not certain, being the overriding consideration in determining the content of all subjects. The students were immured within the walls except for a brief leave on Sunday afternoons. And we read further, were spied upon and regimented from matins, matins to lights out. 
This is this is the Jesuit formation. This is Jesuit formation. Stalin thus described the seminary life in his interview with Emil Ludwig. Emil Ludwig was a very notable Jewish historian in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He wrote a book on Bismarck and Mussolini and some others. But going on, so here's what Emil Ludwig said, this Jewish historian. Ludwig, what drove you to become a rebel? Was it perhaps because your parents treated you badly? Stalin, no, my parents were uneducated people, but they did not treat me badly by any means. It was different in the theological seminary of which I was then a student. In protest against the humiliating regime and the Jesuitical methods that prevailed in the seminary, I was ready to become and eventually did become a revolutionary, a believer in Marxism. Now notice Stalin is familiar with the Jesuits when he's speaking to Ludwig. Ludwig. But do you not grant the Jesuits any good qualities? Stalin. Yes, they are methodical and persevering in their work. But the basis of all their methods is spying, prying, peering into people's souls to subject them to petty torment. And is there good in that? For instance, the spying in the dormitory. At nine o'clock, the bell rings for tea. We go to the dining hall. And when we return, we find that a search has been made and that all our boxes have been turned inside out. What is there good in that? Unquote. Stalin was saying that he was trained by Jesuits in Tiflis. Right here. Okay, continuing on, as we just covered, Stalin's confession that he had been trained by Jesuits at Tiflis Seminary in Georgia. Remember, at this time, from like 1894 to 1899, when he's being trained, the Jesuits are expelled from Russia. The Bolshevik Revolution takes place, 1917. 1922, Lenin, according to the book Descent into Darkness by James J. Zatko, written in 1964, a priest and an instructor at Notre Dame in Indiana, That author tells us that the Jesuits were formally readmitted into Russia by Lenin in 1922. This is huge. Stalin then is overseen by Edmund Walsh. Walsh oversees, oversees certain other leading Jews, Litvinov and others. But Stalin is working with Walsh, Jesuit Edmund Walsh. And 10 years later, or thereabouts, 15 years later, Edmund Walsh will be sitting, be sitting next to Franklin Damnable Roosevelt, in the White House, when Roosevelt formally acknowledges the government of Bolshevik Russia in 19, December, I believe, of 1933, Edmund Walsh is sitting next to FDR when FDR acknowledges the government of communist Bolshevik Russia. This will allow American industrialists to begin to build factories in Russia, one of whom is Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford will entertain Bolsheviks at his Ford Motor Company, and I have this proven in my book, Vatican Assassins, so that they will begin to build Gorky, 
and Gorky will be an, uh, an automotive plant set up in Russia and Ford will provide 300 American families to go over there and work in Bolshevik Stalin's Russia. One of them will be a Jew whose name is Victor Herman. Victor Herman would be a young man. He would have certain world records jumping out of an airplane at, I think, 100,000 feet, something like that. Victor Herman, whose father was a communist, a Jewish communist, thinking that Russia was finally the Shangri-La of communism, his father and, and mother and the family will go over to Russia along with the other families sent by Ford, and all of them will be rounded up and sent to Gulag concentration camps, including Victor Herman, the Jew, and Victor Herman will tell his story in a book titled Coming Out of the Ice, The Unexpected Life by Victor Herman. You got to get it. You got to read it. A goofball movie was made on it years ago with Chris Christopherson, but the utter horrible wickedness of what went on there is accurately depicted by Victor Herman in his book, Coming Out of the Ice. He also wrote another book that is unbelievable. It's an 80-page book. I have it for sale on my website. It's called The Gray People. The Gray People. And it's about life in the concentration camps, the gulag of Russia. And it is unbelievable. you got to read that too. But these concentration camps run in Russia are run by the same Jesuits that are running the concentration camps in Germany. They're going to be the same Jesuit order that's going to run the FEMA camps here in America. The same brotherhood. Just different days, different times. But same doctrine. So Stalin then, uh, Lenin is murdered. He's poisoned in 1926, I believe. 24, 26. And the Jesuits begin to get rid of the Jewish leadership of the Bolsheviks for the next 10 years. And after 10 years, the Jews are openly involved. You have Trotsky building the Red Army and so on. So from like from 1922 to 1932, you have these Jewish leaders that are openly portrayed to the world as running communism. But the man of power, the man of steel, the one who's really going to be put in power is Joseph Stalin. And when Stalin is put in power, he takes over the Kremlin. He's advised by Proskrevichev, and he begins the Great Terror. And during the Great Terror from 1936 to 38, I believe, he's going to kill hundreds of thousands of Russians. And he's going to kill all the leading Jews that were involved in the Bolshevik Revolution, except one. And that Jew, his name is Lazar Kaganovich. All the other Jews will be killed. And Lazar Kaganovich is Stalin's token Jew. To make it look to the, to the Jew bashers of the world that it's really the Jews running Russia. And so... As the Bolshevik Revolution is taking place, there will be a certain priest who's a Jesuit secretly, he's of the Order of St. Jerome, and he's going to write a book. And that book will be known as Mein Kampf. Uh, Leo Lehman tells us in his book Behind the Dictators that a priest really wrote Mein Kampf. And I think Edmund Paris says the same thing in his book, uh, The Vatican Over Europe. Anyway, Hitler did not have the ability to write Mein Kampf. He, all he read was newspapers. He lived in a flop house in Vienna. He was nothing. He was just a loudmouth agitator, Austrian, Roman Catholic. But he will be used by the Jesuits to be the leader of Germany in the West, 
and Stalin will be used by the Jesuits as the leader of the Russians in the East so that Stalin and Hitler who walked the grounds of Schoenberg Castle, the Habsburg Castle in Vienna in 1912 they're buddies both trained by Jesuits both prepared for their roles both financed by Henry Ford both backed by Britain and America with the Anglo-American international white power structure working for the Pope. They're going to bring these guys to power. There's a book called Hitler was a British agent. You need to read that too. Churchill and Hitler and Stalin and FDR and Mussolini all work together along with the Masonic Jewish labor Zionists including Ben-Gurion and, and uh, Theodor Herzl. Not Herzl, but uh, Ben-Gurion and uh, who's the other founder? Oh, Chaim Wiseman. They're all working together. There's another book you got to read called Hitler's Jewish Soldiers. They're all working together. And so one of the things that they have to accomplish during World War II is the destruction of the Pale of Settlement. The Pale of Settlement was started by that prostitute of a whore, Catherine the Great, Catherine the Second the Great, who became the, the Tsarist of Russia in the late 1700s. She will poison her husband, and uh, who is the Tsar, she'll poison him. I forget which Tsar he was, but he will be poisoned by Ka Catherine the Great. And you have Catherine the Great controlled by the Jesuits in Russia, and you have Frederick the Great controlled by the Jesuits in Prussia, the apostate Lutheran, and the perfecter of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, the head mason on all continents, the entire continent at the time. So Frederick the Great and Catherine the Great will work together to begin to build what is called the Pale of Settlement, the herding of Jews into... Poland, um, Hungary, Eastern Russia. This is called the Pale. You can find a map of it on Google. And so when the time is right, Hitler will invade uh, Russia on September 1st of 1939, and Stalin will invade 17 days later on the 18th of September from the east and Stalin and Hitler will divide Poland and they will kill the Polish nationalists, the Polish manhood that love their country Poland they will kill approximately it's no it's no 7,000 it's more like 20,000 they're gonna kill 20,000 Polish men in Smolsk in the Katyn forest and other places to get rid of any Polish manhood that would stand against the occupation of Poland by the Soviets and the Nazis from 1939 to 1941. Because Poland is the place, Roman Catholic Poland, that super power place of the Jesuits in Eastern Europe. The Jesuits will then be the ones behind the erection of the concentration camps, the six death camps in Poland, which was Auschwitz, Treblinka, Chelmo, Belzic, Medanik, and Sobibor. All those camps will be Jesuit-controlled camps run by the Jesuit-controlled SS, because the SS was modeled after the Jesuit order, and you can read this in a book called Heinz Hone's work titled The Order of the Death's Head. The Order of the Death's Head. And as I document in my book, the Gestapo and the Soviet NKVD met together in Poland on three separate occasions before the invasion of Russia and Germany in 1939. 
they worked together. And when Stalin and Hitler come to power, they divide Poland and they enter into a treaty called the ribbentrop molotov Agreement. Ribbentrop is the man from Germany representing Hitler. Molotov is the one from Russia representing Stalin. And in this agreement, they agree to work together. They are in treaty with one another. And because of this agreement, Leon Trotsky denounces Stalin, totally disagrees with this agreement, for which reason Stalin puts a hit out on Trotsky. Trotsky has to leave Europe. He goes to Mexico City, and there a Spanish assassin, Roman Catholic assassin, is sent by Stalin to kill Trotsky with a hatchet. To the head and a, a, a picker a hatchet a nice picker I think it's a hatchet so they're eliminating all the Jewish leaders remember Trotsky built the Red Army remember in 1928 the Nazis the German army is rearmed when they go into Russia and the army is created in Russia because Russia is not a party to the Versailles Treaty this is a great secret, further exploited, further shown by Edmund Walsh in his book, Total Empire. So, <clears throat> Stalin and Hitler will be working together for the destruction of the Jews of the Pale of Settlement. No Jew is allowed to emigrate into Russia. This is no man's land. And... Stalin, anybody that goes into Russia, escapes, he's going to kill him. And the man, the Jewish man who wrote the book, the, the, uh, To Eliminate the Opiate, by Rabbi Marvin Antelman, said that Stalin killed a million Jews. Stalin and Hitler worked together for the entire duration of the war. <clears throat> That's why Stalingrad was lost. Stalingrad was nothing but the mass murder of Russian Orthodox men and Lutheran Prussian men as they were ordered to their deaths in a for 18 months and nearly a million people died at Stalingrad. It was a great Jesuit victory for the ex extirpation of heretics. And meanwhile, Hitler will not allow his armies east to conquer Moscow. I met a former SS man by the name of Freddy, who lived over in Palmyra, Pennsylvania, knew a CIA assassin that I knew over there, and Freddy told me that we were 18 kilometers from Moscow and we were told to go south. We were not allowed to take Moscow because Hitler and Stalin were working together. The Jesuits are building the Soviet Empire to be used against America in a future day as rightly discerned by General George Patton. So, Stalin will donate 20,000 prisoners, Russian prisoners of war, to the Nazis to build Auschwitz. Stalin and Hitler work together. You need to get a book called Hitler's Traitor. Hitler's Traitor. And the, the author, it'll lose me right now, but find it on the Google. It's Hitler's traitor. And he shows that Martin Bormann was the liaison between Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin through the Red Orchestra. And uh, in the book um, Unholy Trinity by Loftus, John Loftus, he talks much about the Red Orchestra. Well, Hitler and Stalin are working together. They're both traitors to their own people. They're both traitors to the Russians and traitors to the Germans. And why wouldn't they be? Because they're foreigners working for the Jesuits. Remember, Stalin admitted he was trained by Jesuits at Tiflis. So Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler are going to eliminate the Jews of the Pale of Settlement. And you know who's going to aid them in doing that? The military government of the United States established by the Jesuits through Franklin D. Roosevelt on March 9, 1933. 
Skull and Bonesman Averill Harriman in 1941, of June of 1941, will sign an agreement giving $11 billion in aid to Stalin's Bolshevik Russia for military war material. It's called Lend-Lease. And Skull and Bonesman, Averill Harriman, will be the one to facilitate it. Averill Harriman will go to Russia. He'll be the personal friend of Joseph Stalin and the great uh, murdered uh, historian of Stanford who wrote the book, uh, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. That great historian, Anthony Sutton, will be murdered after he finished write, writing his book on the skull and bones and their control of Bolshevik Russia and America working together during the Bolshevik Revolution. So they're going to kill the Jews. Uh, that's why FDR, advised by Cordell Hull and these other wicked sinners, Secretary of State at the time, refuses to bomb one set of train tracks leading to Auschwitz. They'll bomb Plowiski. My father was involved in the bombing raids of Plowiski in Romania, bombing the oil fields there. You could have, they, could, they can bomb Plowiski in, in the oil fields in Romania. They could surely bomb one set of tracks to Auschwitz. Oh, no. Because, you see, FDR, Stalin, and Hitler, and Churchill are all working together for the destruction of European Jewry that will necessitate and justify the Jews, surviving Jews, returning to Israel and starting their own country because they're going to see they have no place to live on the face of the earth. And you can read more about this in another book written by John Loftus, a Jesuit educated Irish Catholic, but the book it has lots of good things. It's called The Secret War Against the Jews. And it has FDR and Churchill and Stalin and all those bastards. And by the way, remember, Churchill and Stalin and FDR were all brother Freemasons, according to, according to Jim Shaw's great book, uh, The Deadly Deception. The big three at Yalta were all Masons. So the book you want to read about in the destruction of the Pale of Settlement is called Bloodlands. Bloodlands. A very popular book maybe eight years ago. And it shows the annihilation of the Jews of the Pale of Settlement. All of it overseen by the Jesuits. The Jesuits would also run the Einstein Gruppens into Russia, led by criminals. The Jesuits would oversee the evacuation of his high-level SS out of Europe through certain Jesuit-controlled bishops like Alois Hudal. Hudal oversaw the Vatican rat lines leading out of Austria into Italy and from there all across Europe into Ireland, to Canada, to America. And Francis Cardinal Spellman in 1949 is going to be made a cardinal. He's going to oversee all the Vatican rat lines coming into this country. I'm bringing in all the top Nazis, including Werner von Braun, um, the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Mueller, all these wicked Roman Catholic sinners working for the destruction of not only the Jews, but the Protestants of Europe are brought here. Some estimated 50,000 of them. Well, when Russia and Germany invade Poland in 1939, there is a certain Jesuit priest, American Jesuit, that is involved, and he goes with a Russian Jesuit into Russia, and there he spends five years in Lubyanka. Lubyanka will be the holy office of the Inquisition, as I've said, and there Walter Sisek, a street tough, a Polish American Roman Catholic from the coal region of Pennsylvania. This street tough will be the greatest inquisitor of the 20th century, apart from Stalin himself, in the murder 
of millions of Russian Orthodox people because Walter Sizik will oversee the entire Gulag in Russia for 17 years. He will spend a total of 23 years in Russia. And Kennedy in 1963 arranged for Walter Sizik to be released in exchange for two Russian spies. And so Sizik comes back and he comes back to the novitiate over here in Wernersville, Pennsylvania. He's greeted as a hero when he comes back. That he and that he was a persecuted by the by the communists in Russia and he suffered in the concentration camps. And that's the cover story. But Walter Sizek's dear Jesuit buddy, Daniel L. Flattery, was also a personal friend of George Herbert Walker Bush. That's right. And this little book, With God in Russia, that Sizek will supposedly write, it was probably ghostwritten, shows of how he suffered in the concentration camps in Russia. The secret but true truth of it is he worked, he oversaw the KGB, NKVD, and later KGB. KGB starts in 1953. And for 10 years, he's there in Russia overseeing all of it. And to prove this theory of mine, I got to know a Jesuit over at the novitiate, now a spiritual center in Warnersville, of the Jesuits. It was financed and built by the Brady family out of New York. Nicholas Brady was the head of over 100 New York corporations. He was wealthier than Rockefeller and a high papal knight that died in 1928. His wife, Genevieve Brady, a dame of Malta, greeted Pacelli when he came here in 1936. Pacelli will be going, will go, Secretary of State, who will go on to be the Pope Pius XII overseeing all of these dictators in not only the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust, but the Lutheran Holocaust, the Reformed Holocaust. Remember, the SS had a special camp for Dutch Reformed preachers in the Netherlands. Only they were sent to it. We're never told about that. I think the camp's name was Ulm or something like that. It's one syllable. So, Sizek goes into Russia. He spends five years at Lubyanka perfecting the art of torture. And in Lubyanka, they managed to get certain volumes of the Holy Office of the Inquisition out of Spain and all the methods of torture. And they perfected them in Lubyanka and then subjected their poor Orthodox victims to the Inquisition of the Jesuits running Lubyanka and ultimately, the entire gulag system. Yep. So this is Walter Sizek. And I, through my interest in Walter Sizek, I got to know a Jesuit over here. His name was, his nickname was Brother Suds. And I love the old man. I gave him the gospel, showed him how to be saved. I gave him a copy of my Vatican Assassins, which after he died, just disappeared probably at the provincial's desk in Maryland. Anyway, <clears throat> I talked with Walter Sizek, and I said, Walter, I said, tell me about, I said, uh, yeah, I said, uh, Brother Suds, tell me about Walter Sizek. He said, oh, I knew him well. I saw him, I knew him when he came back from Russia. I said, Brother Suds, Walter Sizek was an inquisitor. He was a mass murderer, killed millions, responsible for the death of millions of Orthodox people. He said, oh, no. I said, tell me, Brother Suds. I said, when you looked at Walter, were, were his hands gnarled as though he worked in a concentration camp for 17 years? And he stopped. And he looked at me. And then he looked down and he said, Oh, Walter. Oh, Walter.
It never occurred to him that Walter Sizek was indeed an inquisitor. And we went out to the graveside of Walter Sizek there, the novitiate, and now the spiritual center of Warnersville. And it's the only gravesite, because remember, all the Jesuit tombstones are the same. It's a white tombstone with a black base. All the same shape, same size, same thing written on for the most part. The name of the Jesuit or the temple coadjutor, the day he was born, ingress, the day he joined, the day he was born, uh, natus, the day he was born, the day he went into the Jesuit order, ingressio, and the day he died, obit, and that's all this on the tombstone. They're all the same. Perfect communism. And we went out there and saw the the crucifixes and the beads all hung on Walter Sizek's tombstone. And there's a special little metal hanger there that all the people come out and hang it on. They put their rocks on the top of the tombstone. This Walter Sizek's a hero. And in the early 2000s, early 2000s, I went with my wife-to-be, Danita. We just decided to take a little ride in my blue Ford Ranger truck out to the novitiate. I said, I want to show you something. I want to show you this cemetery that's shaped with a vaginal shape of the Virgin Mary. So we went out there. And when we went down the road there, down to where that cemetery is, there were maybe 50 Jesuits or so, at least, there with the Jesuit Superior General Peter Hans Kolbenbach. And I looked at him, he looked at me. Not that he knew me, but I just decided I need to get out of there. Well, what they were doing was they were giving a special service for the greatness of Walter Sizek. Jesuit Superior General Peter Hans Kolbenbach with another 50 Jesuits, and they were all in Cossacks. Cossacks. They were all in cassocks because this is what they do. This is what they're about. The destruction of the Protestant Reformation, the destruction of the Orthodox Church. That's why the Jesuits have foisted upon the Orthodox leaders, many of them trained by Jesuits, their perverted Westcott and Horde Greek texts. In the Orthodox Church over in Lancaster, I've seen a person myself in the priest's office, I looked at his Greek text and there it is. Nestle text, Westcott and Hort, Nestle Greek text, pro Jerome's Latin Vulgate. It's not the glorious word of God, the Byzantine text that the Orthodox Church had for 400 years or more. More than that, 700 years. So, Walter Sizek is this inquisitor. Walter Sizek has his grave there in Wernersville. And I encourage any of you Orthodox leaders, you need to take a trip out here. I'll take you to the cemetery. You want to go there. I'll show you where it's at. And this is a, he is a trophy to the Holy Office of the Inquisition, which the Jesuits continue to run today under the guise of communism, fascism, and any other ism that has a military dictator. So I just wanted to make this recording for you, especially you Orthodox people of Russia, to know just who has wrecked your country, who has financed the Bolsheviks, who has financed the Russians, the Russian Red Army. You need to read another book called Nightmare in Red, uh, written by, I believe, Hans Gerlach. When all the Soviet War machine was coming into Germany on the Jeeps and everything. It all said made in USA. As they plundered and decimated Germany, especially Prussia, gang raping the German women, 20 to 1, and the Polish women. The German women were so ra viciously raped, there were 100,000 episiotomies performed, sewing the rectum, and the vagina separating that muscle that was torn by the savage gang rape of the Russian communist red savages, which was the policy of the Jesuits running the Red Army because they wanted to totally destroy the Lutheran white Prussian Saxons because they were the greatest enemy of the Jesuits from Bismarck from 1870 
to the time the Jesuits were given formal re-entry into Germany in 1917 by that filthy swine, Kaiser Wilhelm II, the traitor to his own German people and backer, ultimately, of Adolf Hitler through Kaiser's sons. So this is the horrible, terrible story of what the Jesuits have done to Russia. And the Russian military is being prepared today for what I show in my book called the Sino-Soviet Muslim Invasion. The Jesuits are going to use Russia and China and the other Far East nations in conjunction with the Muslims of Africa to invade North America in a future day for the final destruction of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, for the final destruction of the last bastion of liberty for the Jews in the world, for the final destruction of the last nation that is a portion of it holding to the Reformation King James Bible, the AV 1611, for the final destruction of, a, of the last population that's gun owning. This is what they're being prepared for right now. This is why they ended the Cold War, so that the Jesuits could bring all sorts of Western technology into Russia in preparation for them to go under a military dictator and go ultimately into the invasion of North America. That's why you have the Russian-American space lab, just giving them all the technology they want. There's no Russian technology that doesn't ultimately come from America, that they don't build upon. That includes their atomic detonation in 1953, given to them, to Dirty Harry Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And you can read about this in a book titled Major Jordan's Diary. Okay, well, I think I made my point. I just want all of you people to know that you're listening. Thank you for tuning in. And that uh, you can always listen to my broadcast on 247worldradio.com. I preach and speak every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 12 o'clock, uh, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. for two hours. I cover topics such as these. And it's my prayer that God would send a great awakening among Russian people and all other peoples to see what the Jesuit order, what the Roman papacy run by the Jesuits has done to us for the 20th century, and they intend to do the same thing during the 20th century. So, may God help us to wake up and to believe the true gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, which is the gospel. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent, and to truly believe this gospel because God's going to judge every man one day by his son who is raised from the dead. This man, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the Yeshua of the promise of the Hebrew scriptures, who has come and will come again. A second time without sin unto salvation as the lion of the tribe of Judah. To then punish his enemies save his elect racial brethren, the Hebrew Jewish Israelites, and then institute his thousand-year reign of his Davidic kingdom. So, until we meet again, Maranatha.